Sure. This meeting is being recorded. Gavin Jones is with me today on Mind the Divide. He is a research ecologist with the U.S. Forest Service who has been focusing primarily on spotted owls. Through his research in wildlife habitat, forest dynamics, and responses to disturbances such as wildfire, he has compiled useful data to add to the equation while we work on land management and wildfire mitigation across California, strongly supporting the need to gain control of our forests and prevent more megafires. So thank you for giving me your time today, Gavin, and presenting your information. All right, well, no problem. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> All right, so today um, I'm gonna be giving a talk uh, on the impacts of megafires on old forest species. I'm gonna be focusing primarily on the spotted owls, Megan mentioned, um, but we'll touch on some other uh, critters as well. Uh, so I'm a research ecologist with the US Forest Service um, and an adjunct faculty over at the University of New Mexico. So, uh, you know, I, I may be preaching to the choir in, in, in some ways here, but uh, we, we've been seeing a changing fire uh, regime in the Western US. And the change has been uh, defined by an increasing number of large fire events in the Western US. This is a figure from a recent paper, not mine, um, just demonstrating uh, with some of the, the, the data here, uh, the change in uh, the frequency or, or rather the area of uh, uh, that's burned on an annual basis throughout the Western states. And just, just to draw your attention up here to the upper left corner, um, this is showing uh, just massive uh, increases in terms of the, the percent increase uh, from the beginning of the study period, which of course down here in the 80s is close to zero. So those are very large increases um, percent wise, wise relative to zero in terms of the, the area that's burned across all forests, all forests within that wildland urban interface, wilderness areas and other forest lands uh, across the western U.S. So we have more big fires than we used to have. And we also have more severe fires than we used to have. Again, this is a figure from a paper that's not my own, but really shows this, this point quite clearly. <clears throat> um, this is some work showing uh, the area that's burned annually at high severity. And I believe that in this paper, they define high severity as either greater than 75% or greater than 90% canopy mortality. It's one of, one of those two. Uh, and this is showing that from the mid 1980s, we've seen an eight fold or 800% increase in the area that's burned, that burns at high severity on an annual basis. So we have bigger fires and uh, more severe fires than we used to have. So we're really seeing um, uh, changes in our fire regimes in the Western US relative to, to that, uh, uh, that recent past. <clears throat> um, and so why have we been seeing these increases? Well, there's a number of reasons and anyone who tries to oversimplify it will often be wrong. I'll try to oversimplify it uh, and not be wrong here. Um, but we've, we've uh, within these seasonally dry forests in particular, so these are forests that are, tend to be uh, cold uh, and, and wet in the winter and hot and dry in the summer, um, such as those in the Sierra Nevada, California, where I've spent a lot of my time, we've seen active fire suppression, and, and uh, which has led to forest densification over the past century. So th this is just an example here of what we might consider open forest on the top, uh, maybe more characteristic of, of historical conditions uh, across many, not all, uh, forests in, in, uh, in these dry forest lands. On the top row there, and then the bottom, uh, sort of a denser or closed forest condition. And these are repeat uh, aerial photographs here um, from 1941 and 2005, just showing, at least from above, you can see a lot less ground cover from the sky. And that's because we have more trees in the landscape uh, than we used to in some of these areas that have been fire suppressed. So we've seen fire suppression. Uh, that's changed uh, the uh, uh, number of trees in the landscape. Uh, we've also seen a, a sort of flipping on its head the pyramid uh, of the size distribution of trees in these forests. We have had a selective removal of very large old trees from uh, previous logging, um, where those large old trees have, have been predominantly removed, although some do remain, um, and the landscapes are now skewed towards a high density of smaller trees. And those uh, changing forest conditions 
cannot be considered independently of, of climate change and the effects that climate change and warming and drying of those fuels have had on fire behavior, uh, including the, the extent and the severity, which I just mentioned a moment ago. So these factors together combine uh, to create these, these really different um, fire conditions that we're seeing more and more of in the West. And so why does this matter? Well, it matters for a number of reasons. <laughs> um, but one of the reasons is that we're losing forests. Um, and a lot of these forests uh, that didn't historically experience large high severity fire events are experiencing them, them now. And they're not adapted to regenerate naturally following these disturbances. So what happens is we have a type conversion from a forest landscape to a predominantly non-forest landscape. And in this case, this is a photo of, uh, that was taken 15 years after a, a, the blue fire in Modoc County, California. Um, and you can see uh, uh, you know, skeletons of old trees and on the, the sort of ground cover there, that's um, about a you know, six foot high layer of, um, of ceanothus. So this is kind of shrubby stuff that's above your head and it creates a very persistent condition that, that often will prevent the, the regeneration uh, of uh, conifer species. And in many cases, will reinforce uh, uh, high intensity fires um, uh, within that system. And so this is a type conversion problem that poses uh, a threat to the persistence of forests and as well as the services, the ecosystem services and the habitat that those forests provide uh, to wildlife. And so that's where I've spent a lot of my time is focusing on the effects of wildfire on wildlife. And in particular, this species right here, the, uh, the spotted owl. This is a California spotted owl. And uh, there's two owls in this photo. I had somebody tell me recently they didn't see this photo, this owl on the right until later on. So there's two, one over here. This is the adult on the right, the juvenile here. Um, and I love this photo because I think it embodies some of the tension uh, within this, uh, this area of study of the effects of wildfire on wildlife. Because this uh, individual uh, adult female spotted owl here is, has chosen to nest in a tree that was uh, a snag. Uh, that was uh, produced by fire. So clearly there's a fire scar on this tree. Fire can create habitat. Uh, in this case, I, this, as far as we know, this, this snag burned many decades ago and is still standing and, pro and providing that habitat for the owl, but it's surrounded by green forest. Um, and so uh, uh, the spotted owl in particular is a species that does depend on that green forest or the um, in particular, late cereal or older forest, mature forest conditions uh, tended, you know, tending to be characterized by higher canopy cover, large trees, some uh, complex vertical structure in the understory that produces a microclimate that's suitable for nesting and, and raising young. Um, but there's been a lot of uh, there's been a lot of work uh, specifically on the effects of wildfire on the spotted owl that's led to some confusion in the understanding of how a wildfire might impact this species. And so a lot of my work has been trying to clarify what the impacts of wildfire are on this species and what that might mean for forest restoration. <clears throat> and so uh, I'm gonna share with you a couple of vignettes here. The first is, is looking at the impacts of megafires on spotted owls, focusing on the study that we conducted a couple of years back um, and followed up on more recently. Uh, this is uh, what I'm showing you here. This is uh, the, the King Fire, uh, the 2014 King Fire, which burned in the El Dorado and Tahoe National Forests um, in September and October of 2014. That's that colored blob there. The dashed outline, that's our long-term spotted owl demographic study area. Those white dots, those are our long-term spotted owl study sites where we've gone and visited um, spotted owl nesting sites for many, many years, for several decades since the late 1980s, uh, and uh, tracking these owls and their, their occurrence, their survival, their reproduction, and things like that. And so um, one of the neat things about this study, uh, despite the, the, what I'll show you in a moment, the relatively devastating effect of the, of the fire on the owl, uh, was that it allowed us to conduct a natural experiment. So we had several decades of pre-fire data um, and we also had places that burned and did not burn within the study area. Uh, and we continued to monitor this area following the fire. So this is what we call it a, a before after control impact natural experiment. And this is what we found from that 
that experiment. Uh, what I'm showing you here on the, on the Y axis or the vertical axis, this is the proportion of those sites on the left that I'm showing you that were occupied for time. Um, and uh, on the, the bottom axis here, this is the, uh, the year of study. And there's three different groups I'm showing you here. There's three different groups of sites. So the first group is unburned sites that didn't experience any fire. Those are the ones that are outside of the colorful area here. So these sites out here, for example. There's sites that burned some of their area, some of their territory area at high severity, uh, but less than half. And those are the typically these sites that are going to be along the edge of the fire. And then uh, sites that burn mostly at high severity. Um, those are the sites here in the, in the middle of the, the colorful blob showing the King fire. And so what we found is that the, the sites that burn most severely uh, following the King fire show this, this dramatic decline and um, remained unoccupied for up to six years after the fire. Whereas the sites that experienced some high severity fire, but kind of more of a mixture of, of, of uh, fire severities uh, were relatively stable after the fire, which was similar to those sites that were unburned. And all this, uh, this post-fire uh, tracking that we did, again, was placed within the context of this longer term decline that we had seen on our study area. But this, this uh, uh, the King fire for these sites that experienced mostly high severity fire, it really had some serious uh, negative impacts to the local persistence of those populations or the individuals inhabiting those sites rather. So what about the mechanisms underlying what I just showed you? There's two, there's two uh, mechanisms that drive the occupancy of a given territory. Uh, one is persistence. So whether a given site that is occupied is, is able to persist and remain occupied through time. And so what we found is that the more of a site or the more of a territory, spotted owl territory, that burned at high severity, the less likely that site was to persist after the fire. That's what this figure is showing you here. Uh, the second factor is colonization. So this is the likelihood that an unoccupied site will become occupied after the fire. And we found that the more uh, of, a, of a given site or territory that experienced high severity fire, the less likely that, that territory was to become occupied. And so more high severity fire, it lowers persistence and lowers colonization likelihood. Pyrodiversity actually benefited both persistence and colonization. And so what I mean by pyrodiversity is kind of a mixture of these different burn severities. So um, in this case, we were looking at these different groups of burn severities. So in a place that has a much greater mixture of burn severities, uh, those, those territories are more likely to remain occupied after the fire and more likely to become colonized after the fire if they weren't occupied previously. And we found that salvage logging had no negative effect in, uh, or positive effect in this case. Um, I often get asked what the effects of salvage, post-fire salvage logging are relative to the effects of, of wildfire. And uh, it, it varies on a case-by-case -case basis to be sure, but in this case, um, we did everything we could to try and identify an effective post-fire salvage logging to no avail. This is an, what we call an uninformative parameter, so it didn't explain any of the variation in our, in our experimental model. So the effects of this wildfire, or the effects of the King fire were because of the fire and not because of the post-fire management. What about other uh, old forest species? This is not one of my studies, um, but uh, another species that we think about quite a bit is the fisher uh, in, in uh, California and, and, and uh, Oregon as well, and, and, and generally the Pacific Northwest. Um, but some work has been done recently by um, uh, David Green and others uh, that has shown uh, that the, uh, the amount of area that burns uh, is generally related to lower, as greater areas experience wildfire, you have lower densities of fissure in the landscape. So more wildfire, bad for fissures. And in this particular case, they, um, they found this effect to be true across multiple burn severity. So low, moderate, high burn severity um, all had similar negative effects to fishers, according to their study. Um, and similarly, uh, the, these authors looked at the effect, the potential effects of salvage logging, post-fire salvage logging, relative to those effects of the wildfire. And so you can see these three different colored dots here um, show you the different amounts of salvage logging 
orange is no salvage logging and the, the purple are uh, different degrees of salvage logging. And there was a negative effect of salvage logging, as you can see here at each level of, of burn severity. Um, but similar to our work, uh, it, it appears that the effect of the fire is much greater than the, effect, the, the effect of salvage logging. As you can see, as you go from zero to 100% burned, uh, you get a pretty dramatic decline in overall fissure density. And as you go from those different salvage logging levels, you get relatively smaller changes, but there is a negative effect there of salvage logging, which is not necessarily surprising. But so mega fires can have these, these uh, potentially negative a strong negative impacts to fishers as well. These are two kind of key examples of old forest species uh, within the systems that I've been working with in the Western US uh, being negatively impacted by, by wildfires, the types of wildfires that we're seeing more of. So what I just showed you was two examples of kind of local events. So individual wildfires having effects on individual populations of spotted owls or fishers. Um, but the reality is uh, that our, the questions that we have about the effects of wildfire on these species are much broader. And we want to know what the effects might be across their whole range. And across their range, we're seeing accelerating effects of negative sequences, uh, such as wildfire and drought on mature conifer habitat, that kind of habitat that, that the spotted owl and the fisher rely on. And so uh, I've been involved in some work recently that's tried to quantify uh, how extensive these effects might be across the landscape, rather than looking at these individual populations, how big of a problem really is this? And is this a big problem for these species? So some work led by Zach Steele, my colleague over at UC Berkeley, um, and myself and, and many others, um, we've been mapping uh, the, the effects of wildfire and drought um, in the Southern Sierra Nevada on mature conifer habitat. And uh, Zach has mapped a uh, degradation in conifer forests associated with drought. And so these are showing you here uh, areas in purple. Um, the, the light purple is degraded conifer forest. The dark purple is de degraded mature forest. And I'll talk about those, those definitions in a moment. Um, and then the green areas are areas that have persisted through time. Um, so, this top example, this is uh, drought associated degradation. And then we've also got wildfire associated degradation. So looking within wildfire perimeters, how have we seen changes in uh, uh, the distribution and the quality of uh, conifer and, and mature forest habitat for these uh, fisher and, and, and spotted owl in the Southern Sierra Nevada. <clears throat> Over this period, uh, 2011 through 2020, we saw a lot of drought and wildfire in the Southern Sierra Nevada. And we saw those events uh, correspond with dramatic declines in mature forest habitat. And so over this period from 2011 to 2020, uh, we found a 30% loss in the overall um, distribution of conifer habitat. And we saw a 50% um, loss in mature conifer forest habitat. And in this particular case, when I talk about mature conifer forest, I'm talking about trees that are greater than 30 meters tall and greater than 40% canopy cover. Uh, so um, it's, a, it's a relatively inclusive definition of mature conifer forest, but within that group, uh, we've seen a 50% loss in uh, mature conifer forest. If we slice that even finer to a greater than 60% canopy cover, which is generally considered to be conditions associated with fishers and spotted owl uh, uh, nesting or denning habitat, we've seen an 85% loss in that habitat type just in the past decade. And so the point is that this is a, megafires and drought are producing widespread and rapid loss of this habitat type, which is extremely concerning from the perspective of the widespread persistence of these uh, old forest species. So what do we do about it? Um, and one of the studies that we've been involved in is, is a simulation analysis to look at the effects of simulated treatment across the whole Sierra Nevada. And by treatment, I mean um, you know, canopy reduction, uh, fuels reduction, um, and returning to uh, not, you know, sort of a historical range of variation with respect to forest conditions. We've been looking at how those uh, treatments may affect future wildfire severity and future persistence of spotted owls in particular. 
And so what I'm showing you here, this is some work that was just recently published. Um, uh, this uh, figure on the left, this is the predicted annual increase in severe fire across the Sierra Nevada by mid-century, so by the middle of, of this century, uh, what we'd expect across the landscape in terms of the, the rate of increase of, of uh, severe fire. So things are not looking great by mid-century. There's a predicted increase in, in annual um, a, a severe fire extent in the future, according to our methods. This is based on a no treatment scenario though. So this is kind of business as usual. However, if we, if we treat the landscape, we see a reduction in severe fire. And in this particular case, and I won't get into the details on the scenarios and all that kind of stuff, you can read the paper, but this is a, a scenario here where a significant portion of the landscape is treated and returned to historical conditions or at least closer to historical conditions than they are today. <clears throat> um, we see uh, up to a 50%, 56% reduction in the extent of severe fire uh, by mid-century within the Sierra Nevada, which is very encouraging. Um, and in some cases, the reduction in given areas of severe fire is equivalent to the predicted increase under a no, uh, no treatment scenario. So basically treatments are offsetting. Um, uh, the, the predicted increases in severe fire by mid-century in, in some places. Um, and the effect really differs in terms of where we treat. So on the top, this, this blue and red figure on the top here is showing you um, the reduction or the change in severe fire by mid-century if we treat uh, outside of owl territory. So we don't treat within spotted owl territories. We reduce the future severe fire by about 30%. If we treat the same exact area, but we do treat within owl territories, we increase that to uh, about 56% reduction in severe fire. So the point here is that treating the landscape reduces severe fire, according to our simulation model. And treating within spotted owl territories has a much bigger effect on reducing severe fire. And this is partly because we think the conditions within those territories are likely more flammable. And so therefore you get a bigger bang for your buck when you treat within territory. So what about the effects of these treatments to owl populations? Uh, well, we found that treatments ultimately benefit owl populations, even under scenarios where we uh, assume that treatment uh, alters spotted owl habitat in a negative way. So we found uh, that there may be, under some assumptions, there may be these short-term costs of treatment in terms of reducing uh, spotted owl populations because of uh, altering their habitat, the, the treatment directly altering the habitat conditions, which may reduce quality. However, the benefits of reducing the exposure to severe fire are pretty remarkable and always outweigh the costs um, by the 2040s, at least under, under the scenario I'm showing you here. Uh, and the more of the landscape you treat, so we had different scenarios where you treat uh, from 20% of the landscape to 60% of the landscape, um, and uh, the more of the landscape you treat, the greater reduction in severe fire you get. So ultimately, uh, treatment will, according to our models, will reduce the future extent of severe fire, and it'll also benefit owl populations. So conclusions. Spotted owls experience persistent local extinction after megafires. Uh, these big severe fires are not good for the owl. Uh, Fishers also decline in their density across the landscape after wildfire. This is wildfire of any severity, at least with respect to the study that I, that I shared. Um, and for both owls and fishers, fire is the main culprit. It's not post-fire logging. You may hear arguments uh, that actually all these effects are just post-fire logging, and that couldn't be further from the truth. We've demonstrated this pretty, uh, pretty convincingly, that these these negative effects of megafires are because of the fire, not because of the post-fire uh, activities. <clears throat> um, fourth uh, conclusion here, this is a widespread problem. Uh, we are, we've seen a rapid loss of mature forest habitat, uh, particularly in the Southern Sierra Nevada uh, because of drought and wildfire over the past uh, 10 years. So this is a widespread problem that's having serious local impacts to populations. And, uh, in order to, to move the needle on conserving these old forest species, a paradigm shift toward managed dynamics might be needed. And what I mean by this is embracing the fact that ecosystems have always changed and always will. And so we have um, 
we have some control over the, the future of these ecosystems, e ecosystems and the species that inhabit them. And we have to make some, some choices about how to, how to make those uh, management decisions to meet all those multiple needs. Um, but mature forest habitat is in dire straits right now. And so in order to protect the remaining bit of it, we might need to really change the way we think. And so with that, uh, I wanna thank you for listening in <laughs> and please reach out to me if you have any questions, thank you. All right, see if I can stop the